Hello YouTube, welcome back to Nutkin Farm. Looking out over the nightcap ranges over there, um, you can see some telltale signs of rain coming. But I thought I'd start this video by um, going back to a tree I showed you a couple of videos ago. Uh, an A4 which I looked at in the early stages of flower and said that it would look a treat when it finally did flower. Well, come and have a look at this. It's just out of control. There is fully open flower absolutely everywhere, up and down the tree. I can go underneath the tree and it's underneath it as well, all through one side to the other. I'd say it's sort of mid to late flowering because there's signs of a little bit of uh, nutset and the smell is really quite strong. I, I don't think macadamia pollen smells that strong. Other people disagree, very personal to, but this one smells. And uh, wow, what a sight. Now, bragging rights only. Unfortunately, the A4 doesn't set anywhere near enough nuts compared to the amount of flower that it puts on. But if you want a flower show to show people or you want a backyard tree that makes a real splash in spring, this beats any wattle and uh, highly recommended. Anyway, on with the show. And now I'm over here in block six where um, we've got a few rows down the bottom of A16 and their flowering's no slouch either, really. Um, there's the, you know, massive display of flowers, of course, combined by nuts that in September 2022 still haven't, um, still haven't dropped yet and some stick tights that could even be from the year before that. Um, so yeah, they put on this massive display, but um, you can't rub your hands with glee because they're not terribly good at turning all that flower into lots of nut. I made a video on pollination last year and there's been some water under the bridge even since last year. Quite exciting research that's been done by Hort Innovation um, on behalf of the AMS and the, uh, the macadamia industry generally. And um, there were, and I think decreasingly now, sceptics on, you know, to what extent cross-pollination had a bearing on um, nut performance. What they've done is they've taken lots of nuts that typically shed. Now, after this flowering period where you see these flowers turn into little baby nuts, trees will typically drop a proportion of their crop on the ground. Now, the theory has always been that the tree is self-regulating. It's only sort of uh, keeping the nuts it feels it can take through to a successful um, conclusion. And that's fine. Um, I still believe that to an extent. But what the researchers did was they actually came down uh, underneath these trees and picked up the shedded nuts and did a DNA analysis on them to see whether they were cross-pollinated nuts or self-pollinated nuts and the startling answer was most of the nuts that the trees aborted had been self-pollinated so the tree if, if it has to drop any nuts seems to want to drop self-pollinated nuts first and they cross-checked this by you know hand pollinating trees and making sure that their their data was correct um, and they checked for a second shedding and in the second shedding where there were fewer nuts dropped um, there were some small percentage of cross-pollinated nuts dropped but it's the first initial shedding or arguably the biggest shedding uh, before the, the rest of the nuts really sort of grow up and take hold that was where the self-pollinated nuts ended up so not only do we now know that cross-pollination assists in kernel recovery, assists in you know, overall yield, but we know the consequences of failing to cross-pollinate. You, you might end up with the tree shedding a lot more of its baby nut crop and, and you're getting a worse result as, um, you know, as your outcome. So cross-pollination, all the more important um, relative to how it used to be. Now, Nutkin Farms, um, not altogether different from some other farms, 
there are varieties of trees that do vary among the place. Um, I'm standing here in the middle of three rows of A16s. You can see how generic they are. They're all flowering at the same time and they've got a reasonable flower on. I'm quite happy with what I'm seeing, but they're all A16s. So um, I know now with the research that's been done uh, that A16 isn't particularly good at setting nut. None of the A varieties are terribly good at setting, uh, setting nut. You get lots of flowers, but not much show at the end. So you'd want them to self-pollinate. You'd want them to cross-pollinate, wouldn't you? And that's where we come to how we plant trees and what's the most effective way of doing it. Now, in a recent video, I've talked about a grid planting, which is a concept I've borrowed from Robbie Commons, where he does a grid of nine trees. If you think of your block, not in terms of rows, but in terms of grids of nine, in the middle of every grid of nine is a pollinator tree that is deliberately there to spread pollen to all the surrounding trees. Um, quite often, a block of macadamias will have three rows of one variety, one row of a pollinizing variety, and they'll do them that way. Um, maybe the methods will be tested against each other. I take the view that if a tree is at least even diagonally next to a tree that might pollinate it, it would be better than having sort of three rows of one variety and one row of the next. But there's another catch. The trees actually have to flower at roughly the same time in order to cross-pollinate. There's no point saying this is a different variety tree, therefore I'm all good. The trees actually have to be flowering at the same time or else bees, you know, won't have pollen to transfer from one tree to the other. Now, these trees that I'm looking at here, thankfully have some flowers on them at the moment. These are 660s, or I believe them to be 660s. Um, and they're not that far away from the A16s. I'd rather them be a little bit more sort of interspersed, but at least they're there. However, I wouldn't say they're the ideal pollen partner for an A16. I think on average the flowering happens earlier on the 660s. They're not a terribly heavy flowerer either. They, they do have some and, you know, they're, they're not bad quality flowers. They're nothing like the A16. Now, does that beg the question, is there enough pollen to go around? Um, I don't know, are there enough pollinators to go around? That's a big question too this year with beehives largely stuck on their... their uh, their place and then not able to be moved around without a permit from the government because of this varroa mite uh, scare that we've got. But the interesting data which you can find in this new macadamia toolkit book sold by the AMS but also in the latest edition of the um, AMS journal they've put a timeline up which shows the relative flowering time of all the big macadamia varieties. They do leave some out, unfortunately, but, but all the big ones do come out. And the interesting relationship in terms of my own planting and in terms of what I would recommend people to plant is a relationship between MCT1 and variety R, which is my current favorite. Now, they flower very closely together in time they drop their crops very closely together in time. The main difference between those two varieties, however, is that the MCT1 is thin husked and thin shelled, and therefore a little bit more susceptible to pests, possibly diseases. Whereas variety R is a bit more bulletproof on both those aspects. However, as a pollinizer, sticking MCT1s on a grid of nine in a, uh, in a block of variety R, seems like a pretty good idea. Now, my current experiment is to get uh, a variety 783, which I manually researched myself from the old days, and that's gonna be in my grid of nine for, for variety R. But for future plantings, may well be that we chuck an MCT1 in there instead, 
and, um, and have that as our pollinizer as well. And as they've also learned from pollination research is that you, you know, when you have the right kind of pollen coming from the right kind of tree, you can affect the kernel recovery and the size of the resulting nut. So given that MCT1 is a nice big nut uh, with a reasonably high kernel recovery, that might be another reason why you want to throw it in with a variety like R in a planting. So what does that mean? Well, for sort of mum and dad orchards, um, you, you definitely want to try and get cross-pollination because you want to get as much crop as you can from a fairly small plot. For large commercial operations, uh, I know the considerations are different. I know that things are done very large scale and it's certainly a priority of large farmers for all the nut to be dropping at the same time. Uh, so that harvest costs and maintenance costs and even pruning costs can be similar because all the trees behave a similar way. Um, look, what I'd say in response to that is you still need some cross-pollination and you've got to find out a way of doing that uh, in the context of a large operation because, you know, yield matters you know, the same, if not more, to you guys as well. And um, you can't just rely on self-pollination according to that latest research because you might find a lot of that crop of yours just gets dropped on the ground. So the latest research says cross-pollinate um, and for reasons that are even more notable than they were when I last did a video on the subject. So... I hope that little update helps, particularly for those not keeping track with, with the latest research on macadamia production. Um, I will leave you to it now and go do some more inspecting of trees. Talk to you soon.